Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, John Swinney said eradicating child poverty would be the top priority of his government. But since his statement, we've heard this. Fiona King from Save the Children said, and I quote, there is nothing in this programme for government that truly shifts the dial on child poverty. Dr Lindsay Macdonald of Magic Breakfast said, far from a manifesto on the eradication of child poverty, this plan will struggle to make a significant dent in the child poverty crisis that Scotland faces. And Mary Glasgow, Chief Executive of Children First, said the charity was deeply concerned that the drastic cuts to public spending will throw many children and families already in crisis over the edge. So who's right, John Swinney or the growing list of experts who say his programme will fail to tackle child poverty? First Minister. Mr. Officer, I recognise the enormity of the challenge that we face on child poverty. It is why it is the central mission of my government to eradicate child poverty. And the reason why child poverty is so high is because Scotland has suffered from 14 years of Conservative austerity and welfare cuts which have forced families into poverty. That has resulted, that has resulted in the Scottish Government taking steps to spend over £400 million on in measures such as the Scottish Child Payment, which, are keeping, which along with other measures, are keeping 100,000 children out of poverty. Now, I respect all of the organisations and the individuals that Douglas Ross raised with me. These are people that care deeply about the eradication of poverty, as do I. But I think all of them would accept that child poverty has been made the crisis it is in our country today because of the actions that Douglas Ross voted for when he supported the Conservative Government in the House of Commons. Douglas Ross. John, John, Swinney, John Swinney says he respects and, and cares deeply about these experts. These experts were not speaking about previous decisions of the UK Government or current decisions uh, of the Labour Government. They were commenting on his programme for government. They were commenting specifically on the lack of action within it to tackle child poverty. So if the First Minister won't listen to these experts, perhaps John Swinney will listen to John Swinney. When he was Education Secretary, he announced the policy of free school meals for every primary school pupil in Scotland, and he said this, we must not go back to kids going hungry in the classroom. Now, first, that was supposed to happen in 2022. Then it was delayed to 2026. And now the programme for government seems to ditch it entirely. So can the First Minister be honest with people across Scotland? Will his government deliver their promise of free school meals to all primary school pupils during this session of Parliament? First Minister. Uh, I uh, in no way dismissed the expert commentary that Douglas Ross put to me, and I will not have him misrepresenting my words yeah. in Parliament, because I respect all of those commentators, just as I respect the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, who said in their UK poverty report in 2023, divergence in policy across nations will probably drive greater disparity in poverty rates across the UK. Scotland has taken decisive action in defining child poverty targets in legislation and enhancing the benefit system with a Scottish child payment. And of course, the latest statistics for child poverty show that child poverty rates in Scotland are 24 per cent compared to 30 per cent in England, 29 per cent in Wales and 23 per cent in Northern Ireland. So I simply put that data on the record to demonstrate that we are taking action, but we are having to swim against a tide of austerity and welfare cuts inflicted upon us yeah. by the last Conservative Government, of which Douglas Ross was a supporter. That's before we get near the financial wreckage done by Liz Truss, which Douglas Ross wanted me to emulate. Thank goodness I did not do that. Yeah. Now, the challenges we face are well rehearsed to Parliament by the Finance Secretary on Tuesday. As a consequence of cumulative inflation, our, which over the last three years 
has been 18.9%. 18.9%. That has undermined the value of money that we have available. The Government will deliver the commitment that I set out yesterday to ensure that free school meals are available for all primary one to five pupils on a universal basis and, pre and, and, and primary six and seven who are eligible for the Scottish Child Payment and will deliver that in this parliamentary term. Douglas Ross. I really, I really don't know why SNP members are applauding that because that was a very long answer that didn't address the very specific point. So I'll try again. Does John Swinney commit now to deliver the pledge he made as Education Secretary to deliver free school meals to all primary school pupils by the end of this parliamentary session? That was a simple question that can surely get a simple yes or no answer. And let me ask about another pledge that the SNP made to the poorest children in Scotland. This year's exam results showed that the attainment gap is at a high, at higher level is wider than ever. John Swinney, the Education Secretary, vowed to eradicate the attainment gap completely. Yet John Swinney, the First Minister's bold ambition is merely to seek to reduce it, and he's even failing at that. So is John Swinney proud that his legacy will be Scotland's poorest children falling further behind? First Minister. President Officer, the, the, the Government is facing very challenging financial times and I set out yesterday that we will deliver the commitment to ensure that free school meals are available for primary six and seven pupils who are eligible for the Scottish Child Payment. But we will, the First be, Minister. We, will, we, we will not be able in this parliamentary term to roll out the eligibility on a universal basis across primary six and seven pupils because our budget has been eroded by the fiscal mismanagement yeah. Yeah. and the sky-high inflation yeah. which Douglas Ross was party to creating yeah, as part absolutely. of his support for the United Kingdom Government. Now, on the question of the attainment gap, the Government, of course, has given steadfast support to the education system through the delivery of the Scottish Attainment Challenge and pupil equity funding. Yeah. And what do we see? We see amongst young people leaving school and going into positive destinations, the attainment gap has reduced by 60%. Yep. 60%. That is transformational for the lives of young people in Scotland, and I'm glad the government delivered those commitments. Yep. <laughs> well, I'm glad at my second attempt I was able to get uh, an honest answer out of John Swinney. He has confirmed that the SNP are breaking their promise to deliver free school meals to all primary schools pupils in Scotland. Now, that's movement from his Deputy First Minister just this morning, who, when asked about it on the radio, suggested that it may still be possible and they would do it uh, during this Parliament if budgets allowed. John Swinney has ruled that out. He is now announcing today to people across Scotland that the promise he made Let's hear Mr Secretary, Ross. the promise he asked people to support the SNP to get them into government, has now been broken. Eradicating the attainment gap was supposed to be the SNP's number one priority, but the attainment gap is as wide as ever. And now it's clear that the top priority of eradicating child poverty is going to go the same way because the First Minister has just announced they have abandoned their pledge to provide free school meals for all. For 17 years, this government has overpromised and underdelivered for Scotland's children. No one will believe yet another empty SNP promise to add to the pile. This week's programme for government was supposed to be John Swinney's big relaunch, but instead we got more of the same from an SNP government that is out of ideas and out of ambition. So are broken promises like the one John Swinney has just announced today the best he has to offer Scotland's children? First Minister. President Officer, my commitment to eradicating child poverty is steadfast in this programme for government, and the government is putting the resources in to make sure that we can achieve that objective. With over £400 million pounds been spent on the Scottish Child Payment, which is keeping 100,000 children out of poverty. That is what is happening on this government's watch. We have a lower child poverty rate in Scotland, far too high for my liking, far too high, but it's been made worse by the folly and the actions of the 14 years of the... Well, Douglas Ross, as usual, from his front bench seat, shouts and interrupts at me and he Mr. says Ross. it's on my choices. Mr Ross. 
Yes, it is my choice, Mr Ross. It is my choice to make sure we invest in the future of Scotland, which the Conservative Government destroyed by the austerity agenda that was supported by all of the Conservative members over there. And what the people of Scotland will hear from this Government is a determination to ensure that we deliver on our commitments to lift children out of poverty where the Tories have made the situation worse. Before we move to question two, I will remind members of the requirement that they conduct themselves in a courteous and respectful manner, and that includes respecting the authority of the presiding officer when they are asked to desist from behaviour that is neither. We move to question two, and I call Anna Sarwar. Thank you, presiding officer. Can I take this opportunity to welcome the election of a new UK Labour government and to congratulate Keir Starmer on becoming Prime Minister? I am sure the whole chamber will want to congratulate all of Scotland's MPs, new or returning, regardless of party, who have been elected to represent and deliver for the people of Scotland. Yesterday, the First Minister outlined his programme for government, a statement with no vision, no strategy and no plan. And nowhere was that more glaring than for our NHS. On their watch, over 864,000 Scots are on an NHS waiting list. That is one in six people across the country. Now, the previous two First Ministers promised a catch-up plan and things got worse. But this First Minister did not even mention it. And unbelievably, despite growing demand and lengthening waiting lists, our NHS is performing 50,000 fewer operations a year than before the pandemic. So by what date does John Swinney expect patients to receive the standard of care they deserve and that they are legally entitled to. First Minister. First of all, uh, President Officer, let me uh, echo the words of welcome from, Keir Starm uh, from uh, Anna Sarwar to Keir Starmer as the new Prime Minister. Uh, the Prime Minister telephoned me the day uh, of his election as Prime Minister and came to see me on the Sunday after the election. And I very much welcome the efforts the Prime Minister has made to it create a better relationship between the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom Government. Um, it, frankly, <laughs> it frankly couldn't have been any worse than it was before, um, but I do uh, acknowledge that effort and there have been a series of other engagements and on some of the really significant issues that we are wrestling with um, uh, both governments. There has been deep engagement on some of those questions, which I welcome, and that will be, uh, and the, government, the Scottish Government will engage in all of that activity. Uh, we face uh, significant challenges in the National Health Service, as Mr Sawa knows. Uh, the programme for government set out a range of different interventions. This is where Mr Sawa was incorrect in his question. The programme for government set out a range of interventions that we are making to ensure that we reduce waiting times within the National Health Service, that we expand uh, the capacity for undertaking treatment, and that we improve the, the, the performance in a number of key areas, particularly the diagnostic information I put on the record yesterday about cancer diagnos uh, diagnosis, which is significant in improving the outcomes for individuals in Scotland. Uh, we are working very hard to overcome the uh, the uh, waiting lists that have been created as a consequence of COVID and the health service has been resourced to enable it to do so. Anna Sarwar. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but I don't think he understands that waiting lists are actually getting longer. And let's take a single example, Mark Rogers. A former footballer, Mark, has had prostate problems for years. In April, he was told he needs urgent surgery and he's been using a catheter for five months. It was only meant to be for weeks. He is in unbearable pain and has been having suicidal thoughts. And despite being told his treatment is urgent, he has been told he could have to wait for over another year. He said, I am in constant threat of life-threatening side effects and potential organ damage. I've, I haven't acted on my suicidal thoughts, but I am terrified where depression is leading me. Lothian's Health Board has confirmed that they will not meet the treatment time guarantee for Mark <coughs> and apologised. But saying sorry doesn't cut waiting lists. So when will this government stop failing Mark and the thousands of patients like him? First Minister. 
first of all, I am sorry about the detail that uh, Mr Sawar puts on the record on behalf of Mark Rogers. And, uh, if he wishes to pass particular details to me, uh, I will explore the case and uh, uh, determine if there is anything more that can be done to support the, uh, the treatment for Mr Rogers. I think it is important to put on record the fact that we are still dealing with the aftermath of the COVID pandemic. We are resourcing the health service to a greater degree than would be possible had we just simply replicated the financial settlement from the United Kingdom government. That's come about as a consequence of the decisions that the government in Scotland has taken about taxation, where we've asked those on higher, income, uh, higher incomes to contribute slightly more in taxation, and we have invested a large proportion of that in the National Health Service. So I can give Mr Sawa the assurance that the Government will continue to invest in the National Health Service to expand capacity. We obviously are trying to deliver uh, the treatment that individuals uh, require um, as timorously as is possible. And of course, there are many, many examples of that happening. But I accept, and Mr Salva has put this case on the record, that there will be cases where that is not uh, so. Uh, and I will endeavour to do all that I can to try to resolve those issues on behalf of Mr Rogers and patients like him. The, the frustrating thing is that week after week the First Minister says sorry and week after week those sorries still do not cut waiting lists and people still are failed uh, by this government. And Mark is just one example of thousands of examples right across our NHS which is in crisis. And the statistics are so bad and the stories of patient failure are so regular that it actually feels like the government have become desen desensitised to this crisis. 37,000 Scots on a waiting list for an operation right now have already waited for over a year. Right now, there are almost 5,000 children waiting for mental health care. Thousands of families have already been forced to empty their savings or borrow money to pay for private care, all while the NHS carries out 50,000 fewer operations a year. So can't the First Minister see that behind every one of these numbers is a patient in pain, an anxious family and a workforce at breaking point, and that we need a government in Scotland that is serious about saving our NHS so it's there for people when they need it. First Minister. Can I reassure Mr Sawar that uh, there is nobody in government, certainly not me and certainly not the Health Secretary, who is desensitised to the scale of the challenge and we are very much focused on improving the performance of the National Health Service. Mr Sawar talked about uh, uh, one of the examples that he cited was about um, children's access to mental health services and um, there is um, a stronger performance being delivered there and I welcome that. That's come about because of the commitment and the dedication of staff and the ability to expand capacity to do that. Um, we are taking steps on um, a, to, to ensure that we improve capacity within the health service on cancer, for example. Um, there, are, um, um, the, there is strong performance in terms of the median weights for individuals uh, receiving treatment. Uh, obviously, in that, there will be people that wait longer. I accept that. Uh, but we are trying to reduce those waiting times as quickly as we possibly can do. And that will remain the focus of policy making and decision making within the Scottish Government. And it commands the full attention of the Health Secretary and me as part of that process. Question number three, Lorna Slater. Free school meals for all primary school children was a commitment the Scottish Greens secured back in 2021. This was being delivered when we were in government. Policy right up until April this year was to roll out universally to all children in P6 and 7 by 2026. The Scottish Greens champion free school meals for all because we know that getting school meals to all kids is an effective way to mitigate the impacts and stigma around child poverty. Yet as soon as the Greens are out of the room, the Scottish Government drops the policy. So, can the First Minister explain how we are supposed to take seriously his commitment to tackle child poverty? First Minister. The, the, the Government is facing acute financial challenges because of the persistence of the austerity agenda, because of the cumulative effect of inflation, which has eroded our budgets by, to a value of about one-fifth uh, in the course of the last three years. 
and because we're having to find about £800 million yeah. in this financial this year, year to meet public sector pay claims. Now, Lorna Slater will know from her experience in government that once the financial year starts, the government cannot expand the resources that are available to us. We have a fixed sum of money available to us once the financial year starts. All we can do is either receive consequential funding from the UK government, which might expand that, or we can reallocate uh, resources within the budget. Now, what the government has reluctantly uh, undertaken to do is to take some decisions which will ensure free school meals are available to young people who are in whose families are in receipt of the Scottish Child Payment, which focuses our work on tackling poverty. It absolutely focuses our work on tackling poverty yeah. at a time when we are facing acute financial pressure. And that's the difficult decision the government has had to do. And what Lorna Slater will appreciate from her period in government is the government regularly has to face up to difficult financial choices, particularly when we have a persistence of the austerity climate that we thought we'd seen the back of with the Conservatives. Yeah. Lorna Slater. During our time in government, the Scottish Greens scrapped peak rail fares. We introduced a groundbreaking fund to restore nature and create jobs across rural Scotland. We introduced legislation for a robust system of rent controls. We were on track to ban conversion practices and roll out free bus travel to asylum seekers. All this work is being undone, slashed, watered down or shelved. And now the betrayal of free school meals. The message of this week's programme for government is if you want progressive green policies, you need to vote to have greens in the room. What does the First Minister have to say to voters who backed these policies and now feel let down? First Minister. Uh, can, I, can I just make clear to uh, Lorna Slater's question gives me the opportunity to make clear that the government is progressing with the legislation to ban conversion therapy in Scotland. But we think it's a pragmatic uh, step to take to work with the United yeah. Kingdom government to determine if there is a UK-wide approach to this yeah. which would enable us to avoid some of the difficulties that we found ourselves in in relation to the gender recognition legislation. And that is no walking away from the commitment to end conversion therapy. That is a pragmatic step to try to avoid some of the legislative difficulties this yeah. parliament found itself on on conversion therapy. So I hope that provides some degree of reassurance. Now, the, Lorna Slater asked me what my message is to people at this particular time. Well, I, I, we can look at that a number of ways. The, the government has put in place um, and, and agreed and supported pay deals that will be lifting families out of poverty because of the pay deals that we have agreed. There will be household incomes that will be increasing substantially. Yeah. Poverty will be eroded because of the above inflation pay increases this government is prepared to sanction. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I cannot spend the same money twice. No. I understand the anguish that people feel about these choices, but I cannot spend the same money twice. And the government believes that avoiding industrial action in our public services yeah. so that we can address the issues that Mr Sarwar fairly puts to me about the performance of the health service is important yeah. by ensuring that we deliver pay deals that are commensurate. But I cannot, at the same time as deliver pay deals, in a fixed budget also afford some of the policy commitments that I would dearly love to be introducing, but I cannot because we are still bound by the shackles of austerity. Question yeah, number four, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what analysis the Scottish Government is undertaking of any impact the reductions to winter fuel payments will have on people in Scotland. First Minister. Our analysis suggests that between 110,000 and 130,000 pensioners will remain eligible for a payment in Scotland this winter, a reduction of around 900,000 pensioners. The UK Government's decision to restrict the eligibility for winter fuel payments, taken without any consultation with the Scottish Government, has and will have a devastating impact on pension age, on, on, on the, the win, pen, pension age winter heating payment. This represents a 90% cut to our devolved budget for delivering a universal payment. This is another example of Scotland being at the mercy of Westminster decisions, leaving us with no choice but to follow the UK Government decision. 
Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. 9,078 of my Aberdeen Central constituents are pensioners, uh, and many of them are living in poverty. Uh, and they are worried about labour austerity and the impact on them. Does the First Minister share my view that Labour's brutal cutting of winter fuel payments is not only an attack on older people, but an attack on devolution itself, as the Chancellor showed no interest whatsoever in consulting the Scottish Government ahead of her decision? First Minister. So, so the, the, the point that Kevin Stewart makes about the impact of the winter fuel uh, payment cut is, is, is absolutely valid. There will be pensioners who are not in an affluent position who will be suffering significantly as a consequence of this. But if you then add on to that the fact that there was a commitment to reduce fuel bills by on average £300 from the incoming Labour government, mm -hmm. but in fact people are going to see their fuel bills increase by on average £149, yeah. that is going to compound the damage that is going to be done to those pensioners yeah. as a consequence. So I don't underestimate the scale of the difficulty. If there was another uh, alternative, I would have liked to have taken it, but Mr Stewart will also appreciate from his experience in government, I cannot find the £160 million to enable us to continue that payment on a universal basis, much as I would like to do. Uh, I think on the intergovernmental relations question, uh, I accept that decisions uh, get taken um, abruptly uh, by, the, uh, by governments. Sometimes my government has to do that as well. Uh, but obviously I would encourage the United Kingdom government to engage in uh, deeper a dialogue with the Scottish Government as we try to resolve the very difficult circumstances that we all face. Question number five, Ros McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recently published report, Education Outcomes for Looked After Children 22-23. First Minister. President Officer, the Scottish Government is resolute in our commitment to keep the promise. The attainment gap between care experienced in all children has been narrowing at all levels since 2009-10. This gap continues to narrow at the highest levels of achievement and for low level qualifications remain narrower than it was pre-COVID. Whilst overall figures indicate there is more to be done on exclusions and attendance with support through the Care Experience Children and Young People Fund and the Virtual Head Teacher Network, we have seen real successes in these areas in schools across Scotland. Working with Education Scotland, Local Government and the Promise Scotland, we must learn and build on this work to continue to improve outcomes for children and young people with care experience. I thank the First Minister for that response, but I'm surprised. The key findings of this report are deeply concerning. Educational attainment has fallen, school attendance rates declining, and exclusion rates for looked-after children has risen for the first time in 12 years and is almost six times the rate of all pupils. Despite commitments of the promise, for which an example promised to scrap the exclusions for care experienced children, it's clear from this report that the Scottish Government is failing in this mission. Now, young people across Scotland are now seeing the chances of success increasingly determined by their own circumstances, which is shameful. First Minister, what has gone wrong here? And what more is the Government going to do to ensure our care experienced community get what was promised? First Minister. I think the, the the, the Government's commitment to the, prim, the promise is absolute. I was uh, at, in Government when the commitment was originally given. It will remain steadfast in any Government that I lead. But I, I also recognise the challenges that we face here. Um, the Education Secretary, just, before, just at the start of the, um, the school year, published the steps that have been taken in relation to behaviour and attendance within our schools, because we recognise, and this has been prompted by constructive discussion within Parliament, that in the aftermath of COVID, there are significant implications in relation to school attendance and behaviour as a consequence of the disruptive effect of COVID. And that affects all young people, and it will have an effect on care experienced young people into the bargain. So we will continue our focus on addressing these issues. There are, of course, other aspects of the, uh, the work that we're taking forward, which are 
um, are, are being implemented as part of our commitments to the promise. One of them uh, was the enactment of the provisions of the Children Care and Justice Scotland Act 2024, which ends the placement of uh, children in young offenders institutions in Scotland. I'm glad that came into force on the 28th of August, and I'm deeply grateful to everybody across our system who's made that possible. Uh, and that is just one other commitment in the promise which the government has delivered, and we will deliver more. Thank you. More concise questions and responses will enable more members to have an opportunity to put questions. I call Martin Whitfield. Very grateful, Presiding Officer. The gap in attendance rates between looked after pupils and all pupils in secondary schools has widened to eight percentage points in 22 23. This means that the actions taken pre previously have not had a positive difference in getting these young people to school. So, can the First Minister say what specifically is going to change to get attendance for care experienced young people up? First Minister. I think some of the points that uh, I recognise the point that Mr Whitfield makes, and some of the, the points are contained within the, uh, the, the, the work that I set out in my original answer, where we will be trying to ensure that we maintain young people's engagement in education in all circumstances. Now, obviously, attendance would be uh, desirable, uh, ideal. Um, but but, but the, well, Mr Whitfield shouts to me essential. Um, I, I, I would like it to be essential, I would like it to be ideal, but there are other ways of reaching children with their education, by taking their edu education to them if there is a difficulty getting them into school. And that's part of the measures that have been exhausted to make sure that we establish the connection with young people to maintain their education, and that approach will lie at the heart of the steps that we take. Question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to reports that newly qualified nurses are unable to find employment in the NHS despite there being over 3,300 whole time equivalent unfilled nursing and midwifery vacancies. First Minister. Officer, the Scottish Government hugely values the work of nurses and midwives. Uh, we continue to support our health boards to ensure that graduates can secure, secure jobs uh, in available roles within the National Health Service, and we work with board, boards to ensure that we reinforce their commitment to maximising the opportunities for newly qualified nurses to find employment. Jackie Bailey. Just yesterday, the First Minister promised women more support from pregnancy through birth. Yet in the past few weeks, my office has been inundated with emails from distressed midwifery graduates and newly qualified paediatric nurses unable to get jobs. Workforce planning needs to deliver safe staffing levels, yet hundreds of midwives and paediatric nurses are unemployed this year when we know there are serious staff shortages. At least £12 million has been spent on their training, but cuts and vacancy freezes mean that they don't have jobs. Existing staff are burnt out and leaving, patient outcomes are worse, and the government is in breach of its own legislation on safe staffing. So can I ask the First Minister whether this is just another case of SNP financial incompetence, and his words yesterday were just empty rhetoric, or will he act to ensure that these nurses fill the vacancies we know exist in midwifery and in paediatrics? First Minister. Well, I, I, I would say to Jackie Bailey, I, I, I want to make sure that the skills and the talents of individuals are properly used within our health service. But under this government, uh, qualified nurses and midwife numbers have increased by 16.1 per cent. Um, the, in paediatric nursing, the number of qualified nurses has also increased, um, and that's up by 1.7 per cent in the last year. And across qualified midwife jobs, there's been an increase of 4.5 per cent in the last year. So these are some of the commitments that we are delivering. Now, obviously, as I said in my original answer, uh, I, I want to encourage health boards to um, ensure that they've got the resources and the staffing available to deliver the services uh, and the support that I talked about in the programme for government yesterday, because I recognise that constancy of support, consistency of support, is being essential in supporting um, women during pregnancy, and I want to make sure that the best outcomes can be achieved by that approach. 
Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I'm sure the Chamber, uh, including Jackie Bailey, will uh, welcome the First Minister's comments around the 4.5% increase in the number of nursing and mid midwifery posts since last year. But can I ask the First Minister what further steps are being taken, particularly by the Nursing and Midwifery Task Force, to ensure that qualified nurses continue to be supported through the hiring process? First Minister. So, so the Nursing and Midwifery Task Force um, is working collaboratively with stakeholders, including the Royal College of Nursing and the Royal College of Midwives, to uh, develop the actions that will help us to build a sustainable, attractive and respected nursing and midwifery workforce. So that is the workforce planning that I was being asked about a moment ago, which is being undertaken. Um, the, workforce, uh, the work plan of actions will be shaped by the voice of the current and future nursing and midwifery workforce um, as part of the task force activity. And we expect the final report and the work plan to be pub published later on this year. Thank you. We move to constituency and general supplementaries. I call Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, yesterday's exclusive article in The Courier uh, made very clear that to date the Scottish Government has not had any engagement with the Libyan authorities about the disgraced surgeon Professor El Jamel. But it also put on record that the Cabinet Secretary for Health is now suggesting that that might be possible. Could the First Minister confirm that that is the case? First Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, the, um, obviously there is you know, widespread concern about the LGML case, and it is the subject, of course, of a public inquiry that is underway. Um, the Health Secretary is looking carefully at these issues to determine uh, what uh, approach we can take to ensure that any of the concerns that have been uh, raised in the news article can be uh, addressed as effectively uh, as possible and for any of the information that we hold to be available to the Libyan authorities as appropriate. Ms Gibson. Officer, the First Minister will share my astonishment that the UK Labour government has shamefully cut 140 to £160 million in winter fuel payments to Scottish pensioners this year while reportedly providing the Scotland office with a similar sum, £150 million, with which to undermine devolution. What does the First Minister believe that says about Labour's priorities and its approach to and respect for Scotland? First Minister. So, so I was surprised by those reports because I thought we would be entering an era where after the damage that was done to the powers of the Scottish Parliament by the last Conservative government, which were resisted by the Labour Party whilst in opposition in the Internal Market Act and the Subsidy Control Act, that we would see those provisions uh, reversed. And I think that would be a good thing if those provisions were to be reversed, because they directly erode the powers of this Parliament. Yep. Uh, the public were never asked. Brexit was used as an excuse yep. for eroding the powers of this Parliament. And where you have proper and effective devolution, this Parliament should have the responsibility to take forward those um, areas of responsibility, and they should not have the ability to be undermined by the actions of the United Kingdom Government. So I hope uh, the UK Government will take the lead from Mr Gibson's question and reverse those provisions that are undesirable. Michael Mara. I know that the First Minister will want to join me in welcoming today's superb news of £30 million of funding from the new UK Labour Government for life sciences research at the University of Dundee. Uh, this research work is extraordinary and it is vital. It is delivering breakthroughs in the treatment of skin cancer and the prospect of new, this new funding advancing the fight against Parkinson's and Crohn's disease. The University of Dundee has now been the leading life sciences university in the UK for two decades. I know the Parliament will want to recognise that. Does the First Minister agree with me that the diversity of our world-leading universities across Scotland is a vital national strength. And what can he do to continue to support that work and the diversity of all our universities in groundbreaking research in science? First Minister. Uh, uh, so I'm very, uh, as Mr Mara will not be surprised, I'm very familiar with the life sciences work of the University of Dundee. It's been my privilege over my parliamentary career to talk about these issues on many occasions with um, uh, individuals such as um, Professor Mike Ferguson, who has done such a superb work in developing uh, the, um, the uh, resources at the University of Dundee, of course, um, built on very strong foundations over many years. Uh, so the University of Dundee has captured 
uh, a significant uh, role in life science research over many years. Um, I think it's uh, an area of critical strength. It's attracted a lot of support through Scottish Enterprise and through Scottish Government funding over many years. The Deputy First Minister was visiting the facilities over the summer, uh, and uh, I wish the University of Dundee every success, and the Government will work collaboratively to ensure that is enhanced. Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of reports of more than 400 jobs at risk at the Mitsubishi Electric plant in Livingston. This announcement could have a significant impact both socially and economically for my constituents in neighbouring Edinburgh, Pentlands and beyond. Can the First Minister outline what engagement the Scottish Government has had with Mitsubishi and what support is in place for those at risk of redundancy? First Minister. So I was concerned to hear the reports uh, about the proposals from Mitsubishi Electric. It's a, it's a, a very significant and highly specialised uh, uh, asset within Scotland. Uh, I've visited it myself uh, in the past. The Minister for Employment and Investment has spoken with Mitsubishi Electric to understand the rationale behind their position. Scottish Enterprise are working closely with the company to consider all viable options. And um, we will, of course, be in a position to support employees if, if, if we reach that point where there is any loss of employment. But the intervention of Scottish Enterprise is designed to try to um, to, to create a pathway to avoid this situation, and the, the, the uh, focused activities of Scottish Enterprise will be at the disposal of the company to avoid any industrial uh, loss of employment. Thank you, Presiding Officer. New Cumnock residents have raised concerns of raw sewage being dumped in the area under the guise of a land restoration project. Locals believe this is a health and safety hazard that is contaminating local watercourses and affecting local businesses, forcing them to close their doors due to the stench. This is not the first time the issue of waste dumping has been raised in the area. I have raised the issue of Turbolton Moss landfill site for over three years and little progress has been made. Can I ask the First Minister what checks are made on land that has been designated as a restoration project and what measures are in place to ensure that discarded waste materials complies with regulations? First Minister. Well, these, these, these points are very concerning that Sharon Dowie puts on the record uh, and on, on the face of it, it sounds to me wholly unacceptable. Um, so the regulatory authorities in Scottish Water and in SEPA um, uh, should be, uh, and also in the local authorities, should be undertaking um, scrutiny of these issues. And uh, we will certainly, uh, I, I, if Chandai would like to furnish me with more information, uh, I will certainly raise those with the re relevant regulatory authorities, because our constituents should not have to endure that experience. Paul O'Kane. Disappointing, unjustifiable and a breach of trust is how human rights organisations like the Scottish Human Rights Commission, Amnesty and the Human Rights Consortium have described the government abandoning human rights legislation from this session of Parliament. And indeed, coupled with the apparent abandoning of the Learning Disability, um, Neurodiversity and Autism Bill and decisions such as reprofiling £10 million of money for changing places' toilets, what does the First Minister think this says to disabled people? And what does he think more widely it says to people whose human rights are often most at risk? Uh, what is his government going to do about this? First Minister. Well, the, the government takes a number of steps to ensure that the, the rights and the uh, support for disabled people are taken forward um, over the, the summer. Um, I met, along with the Equalities Minister, the Glasgow Disability Alliance and a number of other organisations representing people with disabilities uh, in Glasgow. Uh, and we had a very open conversation about some of the issues that require to be addressed. And I can assure Mr O'Kane and stakeholders that the Government takes very seriously these issues and will take all practical steps we can to address the issues that uh, are of concern. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Parents and carers and pupils in Motherwell and Wishaw have repeatedly tried to raise concerns after the Labour North Lanarkshire administration, with support from the Conservatives, cut school transport provision. I share the concerns, having walked some of these routes with the families, and also watched the brilliant video from Sean Ferrier, Sean's Walk to School, detailing the hazards he will face if this is rolled out to primary schools as planned next year. Can I ask the First Minister what processes are in place for parents, carers and pupils to challenge decisions on safety grounds and, uh, and 
challenge the local authorities' refusal to review these walking routes. First Minister. Uh, President Officer, the issues at stake here are probably a matter for the local authority to determine, but the local authority have a duty to make arrangements that they consider necessary for the transport of pupils between home and school um, and to have regard to their safety. So that commitment is a, a significant element of the guidance that is available and that uh, has to be addressed by the local authority. And the local authority's engagement processes should be um, uh, uh, designed to ensure that parents and carers can make those representations where they are concerned about the safety of their children and the local authorities should take those seriously. And all over Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister will be aware, uh, since plans for a new Galloway National Park were announced over the summer, there has been significant and growing opposition to this proposal, which now spills into my own Dumfrieshire constituency. Many fear this promises to be yet another example of urban do-gooders imposing their sanitised, over-regulated idea of the countryside on already fragile rural and agricultural communities. It is not supported by the local NFU and hundreds of people uh, are concerned with what is planned. Can the First Minister give a guarantee today that if local people say no to the proposal, it will not go ahead? First Minister. Well, I, 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 obviously... There is an aspiration for there to be national parks. Part of my constituency is in a national park and uh, there is a lot of good work is undertaken there. But obviously the process of taking forward the, um, the, the proposals in relation to the, Gal the, the Galway National Park requires engagement and consultation. Um, uh, the Government stands ready to undertake that dialogue and discussion uh, and will obviously listen to the points that are put forward by Mr Mundell and his constituents and the, um, the constituents who are influenced and affected by this and, uh, and, and will come to its conclusions. But I, I would simply encourage anyone who has got a view to express about this to take part in the consultation process. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Sarah Boyack, and there will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and the public gallery to do so.